very glad that you can join us in this presentation of the Mercer CFA Institute, Institute uh, Global Pension Index report. And Martin Lewin, Lewington, uh, the CEO of Mercer New Zealand, is going to run through the key findings, looking at how New Zealand's retirement income system compares with that of other countries, and also uh, discussing the policy implications. Now, also, I'll be joining the panel as a commentator. I'm board director at CFA New Zealand. And also with me have Aaron Drew, who's managing director of my fiduciary and FI360 Pacific uh, also will be here on the panel as a commentator as well. So welcome everyone and thank you. Uh, also just for housekeeping purposes, we do have a Q&A button in the webinar itself. So if you do have any questions, then feel free to submit your question there and we'll uh, get to it and aim to answer it. And anything outstanding, then we'll uh, get back to you as well. So with that, uh, without further ado, kicking off, thanks, Martin. Uh, kia ora and um, welcome all. Yeah, unfortunately, this isn't a face-to-face, -face, you know, as um, Christina had mentioned, the, um, our lives are continually being disrupted by COVID and I suspect will continue to be disrupted for some time. And today we're going to find out whether we believe that this is the case for pensions um, as Christina mentioned, I am the CEO of MERS and have been for the last 10 years. Uh, 20 years before that, I was involved in corporate finance um, activities, including an eight-year stint, um, Treaty of Waitangi negotiations. Just a bit about Mercer. Look, we're a, um, one of the world's leading professional services firms uh, in the areas of risk, uh, people and strategy. But we're really known in New Zealand as being a, um, uh, an asset manager a KiwiSaver provider and also a major provider of corporate superannuations. Um, David Knox, uh, he's the, the lead author of this study. He's a senior partner in our Melbourne office. He's an actuary and he's been, uh, he's a real icon of the superannuation industry, been involved in it for most of his career, both as a um, advisor to government and regulatory bodies, but also as a director on lots of superannuation schemes. And this is his 12th year of actually writing the, um, the report. And, you know, it is great to be in partnership with the, um, the CPA, CFA Institute. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, the, to me, uh, look, pension systems are absolutely crucial to the fabric of society. They impact on the well-being of billions of people around the world. And uh, the CFA in 2020 did the Future Finance Survey and found that 50% of individuals rate retirement income as their number one investment goal. But globally, trust and pension systems is lower than it should be. So trust and pension systems is low. And then 2020 came, and that's changed it all again. So there's been the impacts, the, the direct impacts of COVID, but also market volatility. So it's even more important to make sure we have pension systems that are fit for purpose, and I believe we can do better. Just a bit of a health warning on the, the index. Um, look, it's comparative and re relative. It's not actually absolute. Uh, we try and use objective data. Well, we actually do, we do use objective data from, from respective bodies. Um, there is some subjective elements in there, but more around the weightings that we actually pro provide. But obviously there are things there that aren't captured in the index that are subjective, but they are very difficult to measure, so not included. Um, it's around 50 indicators used, and the index does provide a, um, an overall system rating. It doesn't say or rate what an individual may or may not receive, and doesn't address what the best pension fund actually is or available. So, this, some of the things that we look at, there's three real fundamental questions that we're, we're interested in. And the first one is adequacy. So what does the system actually provide? Or you know, what do we actually get out of the system? The second is around sustainability. Can the system keep on delivering? Uh, not only this year, but the next year, the next 10 years, and actually for generations. And as we now know, pandemics to come. So adequacy and sustainability, both are really important. Why? We only need to look at Greece, for example, provided a great benefits, 
that the system wasn't sustainable. So the third area we need to be sure of is whether we can actually trust the system. So the integrity, if we don't trust it, then I say it's not sustainable over the long term, that will actually lose our confidence. So how do we pull it all together? It's really, it's, we ask lots of questions, get the answers to these and add up all the scores in each of those three buckets, the adequacy, sustainability and integrity bus bucket. We do weight adequacy slightly more than integrity. Um, and then we arrive at an actual score. So we'll go through a wee bit more detail as, as we go. Um, with adequacy, we actually look at what the minimum pension is. And um, so what happens if we didn't have any private provision? So in New Zealand's case, it's actually New Zealand super. We look at the net replacement rate. So that really measures how effectively the pension system provides the retirement income to replace your earnings. I will look at other desirable features, particularly in the, the private pension space. We look at level of household savings and also household debt. Just remember that about for, for New Zealand's case. Looking at also the level of home ownership, uh, level of growth assets actually within the portfolio. So with, when we come up with the score there, New Zealand we rate at 60, the score we end up with there is 63.8. But if we look at the top three, we've got Netherlands, at number one, Denmark, and Germany. Um, New Zealand came in actually at 18th on adequacy, and there was a couple of things that dragged us down. And it was really around that net household savings rate and also net household debts. And we were in, I was gonna say good company, but there was some like some, un, uh, there was some familiar suspects there as well uh, in that same group. So Australia, Canada, UK, and a couple of surprises, Switzerland and Norway also scored poorly here for similar reasons really around the level of household savings and net household debt. Uh, next area we look at is sustainability. So are we putting enough money aside for the future? So the questions around how much we're we putting aside as a percentage of GDP, demographic and issues around life expectancy or when you can actually um, receive the pension. Labor force participation, you know, how long are we working? Or do we all stop at 65 or, or younger? What's the level of public debt, the, the economic growth for the economy? Actually, that one has gone backwards for most countries due to COVID. The top three countries in sustainability, Denmark, Netherlands, and Australia. But probably of more interest, well, to me anyway, is the seeing two developed economies in the bottom three, so both Italy and Austria. They've put virtually nothing aside for the future. New Zealand came in ninth with a score of 62.9. Third area is around integrity. Um, so integrity is all about the trust and confidence. And so things like regulation and governance protection, how we actually communicate to members, it's all the sorts of things that we have to and should do, and do we exceed that? Costs are also important. You know, it's very virtually impossible to get the costs of the whole system, so we had to include a couple of proxies there. Uh, top three in integrity, Finland, Norway, Netherlands, and New Zealand has a very strong showing here. So let's bring it all together and look at how these various countries have performed overall. So if you look at um, the Pacific, Australia, and New Zealand, we're doing not too bad. So Australia actually came in fourth with a score of 74.1, and they get a B grade. And New Zealand came in at 10th overall with an overall score of 68.3 and also got a B grade. But on the leaderboard, we do need to look in that area where the, the circle's highlighted. We've got Netherlands, Denmark, a bit of an outlier is Israel. So Netherlands had a score of 82.6 and um, Denmark 81.4. So they're both A-rated um, pension schemes. Um, pension systems and then Israel coming in at number three 
um, with a, 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 B, a strong B rating there. Now I'm conscious they get the opportunity to ask Q&A, so any questions and use the Q&A function, but I have gone and got my screen on full, so I've got no way of actually seeing any questions at the moment, no matter whether I move my mouse around. So I'll look at one of my co-commentators to see if they can see the Q&A just in case there is coming through. Oh, there's none at the moment. <laughs> hey. You know. oh. hey, thanks, Kylie. <laughs> um, so now we're looking at the impact of COVID-19 and what we think the immediate impact. And look, I think um, Christina and Aaron will have a lot more to contribute in this area than I can. But for the, for the actual um, the index for our report, we reduced the, um, the scores by about 1.2 to reflect the fact that um, COVID is having an immediate impact with lower economic growth. Although economies are expected to bounce back in 2021 at the time this report was written. So perhaps Christina, if you've got some comments here. Yeah, thanks Martin. So when we look at what's gone on in the New Zealand economy over the past year as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak, what we've seen more recently is that activity has rebounded back uh, much stronger than what many at the, like say a year ago, had anticipated at the height of the lockdown and the outbreak period. Um, what we're seeing is that the New Zealand economy is proving to be more resilient and also responding to that unprecedented amount of stimulus both from the government and the Reserve Bank, primarily in the form of record low interest rates, uh, but also increased welfare and also increased government spending, particularly on areas such as infrastructure. Uh, also, we're benefiting from strong global demand for New Zealand primary production, so things such as horticulture production. Uh, so we're seeing that come through and what we're seeing is a V-shaped recovery for the New Zealand economy. And this V is sharper than also what many had expected. Now, at the macro level, this is a positive picture for the New Zealand economy, but delving through the detail, we can see that this recovery has actually been, or this impact of COVID, I should say, has been uneven across the sectors. And also with that, it has implications uh, for what it means for the gender gap. So for example, uh, we can see that over the second half of 2020, we've had that strong rebound in construction activity leading the charge in the New Zealand economic recovery. And we can see that in the latest labour market data where it showed that increase in jobs in the construction sector versus in contrast to that decline in jobs in the tourism and in, uh, related industries and also in media. So what, we, what this um, means is that when we look at the proportion of say uh, men versus uh, women in like across the different industries, given the nature of the jobs and which have, uh, I should say, benefited um, over the past year versus those that have felt the effects most acutely. For example, if we look at uh, the uh, field jobs, uh, going from February uh, last year to June last year, we can see that um, the decline in jobs amongst women of over 11,700 is much greater than the over 4, 000, just over 4,000 um, in decline in jobs amongst men. So really also seeing that come through in the increase in unemployment amongst women over the past year versus uh, the decline actually in unemployment uh, in amongst men. So what this means is that it does have implications for that gender gap when it comes to retirement savings and retirement income down the track. Hey, thanks, Christina. You got anything to add there, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, part of the real challenge um, we have now is that with interest rates as low as they are, that means very, very low uh, returns almost surely from fixed income. And um, New Zealand's retirement system has still uh, got a very large allocation to those so-called defensive uh, assets. And um, so I think there's a, there's a real challenge that um, I'm sure your firm's going through, Martin, trying to think, well, what are the ways that we can um, make portfolios more resilient to the risk that we do have interest rates uh, eventually start uh, climbing in the future? And, and just to sort of echo a little bit or, or draw a bit of a corollary from Christina's comments, you know, when the economy has performed as strongly as it has, it sort of means that 
uh, there probably was, uh, at least with the benefit of hindsight, excessive amount of um, stimulus. And so that does need to be taken back at some point. And I think markets are starting to really um, factor that in, We're just starting to factor that in. Hey, thanks, Aaron. And that's a really a segue into the next is um, <clears throat> next factor that we're looking at is the, the impact of um, COVID in the future. Um, so a couple of things that we're thinking about is that we will have less money in the system to actually pay out pensions and benefits. Um, we're probably expecting lower contributions from, with given the, the unemployment, uh, reduced salaries. Perhaps there's less money going in. Uh, Christine has highlighted the fact too that that pension gap will get wider, uh, particularly with um, females seem to be worse affected by the, the, the impact of the pandemic on employment opportunities. And yeah, look, expected investment returns have got to be uh, lower uh, than, than the historic pattern of them over the last eight or so years. Um, and we could possibly see more money being taken out of pension systems, you know, under, so in Kiwi say where we have hardship opportunity, you know, the, the hardship opportunity withdrawals for, for first homes. The other aspects around um, migration, given our borders are closed, we're, we're not getting the inward um, migration. And also the expectation is that fertility rates will be will decrease. So in the future, there'll be a higher old age dependency uh, ratio. Um, but there is one upside, and it's probably a bit more anecdotal, although Christina may be able to share a bit more light on it, is household savings. Um, certainly globally seem to be high at the moment as there is less spending. But overall, uh, the future is uh, that COVID will have a negative impact on uh, pension systems. Are we saving more, Christina? Yeah, so jumping in there um, on the points about the government debt, uh, that's when you look at, we look at Treasury's uh, half yearly update going from uh, the half yearly update in 2019 to what we saw in their projections uh, in 2020 uh, for say just net core crown debt for the year June year 2024. We can see that um, their projection for this debt blows out from less than 20% a year ago to now over 50%. So that has implications for constraints that the government faces when it's uh, thinking about spending ahead. Thanks, Christina. Um, just before I move on, there's been a couple of questions, and one again is a nice lead into well, so how do we improve the New Zealand system? I'll just park that because we'll get on to that. The other question is about you know what countries were actually um, involved in this, um, this this survey. There's 39 countries. Uh, Russia wasn't one of them, but there are some quite unusual or, or different economies rather than the pure democracies that we would anticipate. You know, countries uh, China, Chile, Turkey are all participants in this survey. So there will be a link. You can download the report and um, get a snapshot on how each of those countries are dealing in their own ways, um, providing for a, a pension system for, for their, their population. So the thesis is, or the, our proposition is that the global systems, your know, reforms, changes are needed and also I'd, I'd suggest that uh, the New Zealand system we can improve. So probably dealing with um, New Zealand first up, I think one of the first things we think, uh, and we look at what other countries are doing, our, our le level of KiwiSaver contributions are pretty low. Um, and so look, we would encourage an increase in the level of KiwiSaver contributions. Uh, the second thing though is this, this balancing act We'd also encourage um, uh, households to, to save more. So not only invest in their Kiwi saver, but one way of saving actually is to reduce their level of household debt. So that's another thing that we need to have a look at. But of course, the, third, the other thing that we're needing to balance is that owning your own home is a pretty fundamental um, uh, platform or, or pillar of retirement savings, particularly for New Zealanders. And uh, a lot of the discussion you'll see in the media around the level of the New Zealand super um, is, is very generous. In fact, we got 10 out of 10 uh, for the, the generosity of that system and also the integrity of it. Um, however, it does assume that when you get to 65, 
uh, you will own your own home. And that's getting increasingly hard for, for New Zealanders today. I think the third, third area New Zealand needs to focus on is making sure that part of Kiwi is, is we do a really good job of accumulating assets. So we've got the, there is still quite a vibrant and, and um, very much growing corporate super scheme in New Zealand, but we've also obviously got the Kiwi Saver. So that's the accumulation phase. Where we're weak is the decumulation or providing an income, turning that, that, that pot of money into an income stream. Um, so that's uh, an opportunity, I believe, for, for New Zealand. And then the fourth area is we do need to increase the coverage. Um, you know, there's a, a number of self-employed, there's the contract workers, the gig economy, just the nature of a lot of um, uh, uh, occupations that New Zealanders pursue does make it a bit harder <clears throat> to, to keep them in the, the KiwiSaver or keep them contribute to KiwiSaver or, or encourage them to, to, to join. Um, other things, you know, you can see the list there, um, you know, increase the, the pension age. Look, a lot of these are really dependent on the society that they are actually uh, your, your own situation. So with New Zealand, um, I think both governments, the, the Labour government and also the previous national government, uh, don't have the appetite to increase the age. So that's just one of the levers that, that we don't necessarily have. So there are other ways of actually addressing or, or improving your pension system. I do think the one other area that we can't lose sight of is reducing that pension gap. So it's not only the diversity, so the, 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 the amount that um, male versus females manage to accumulate over their working life for a whole host of reasons, but there's also occupational um, lack of diversity, you know, uh, challenges that some occupations don't earn as much and you don't, you're not able to work as long. And I think that whole gap between the haves and the have nots is only going to widen and, and pensions could contribute to that. But um, that's Mercer's thoughts and a few of my own thrown in there. I'd be just interested in the other panellists. So Aaron or, or Christina, have you got any thoughts on what forms are or aren't needed both globally or in New Zealand? Maybe I'll um, start there. And um, I'm very pleased um, that someone did ask the question, what can we, we do about it? <laughs> And um, I'm also pleased I no longer work uh, for the government sector, so I can actually say what I really think. Um, so, um, look, so first of all, I think it's incredibly valuable to have these types of cross-country studies. Um, and um, I think that the, the thrust of the report that we're now scoring pretty good on the integrity uh, side of things is a, is a bit of a, um, I guess, reflection of the really hard work the FMA, um, the regulators, MB, government, actually the industry has done over the past yeah. few years to really lift um, standards and increase our compliance in, um, in a number of areas. Um, but we do score, I think you, there was a C plus sitting in there, Martin, um, yeah. um, relatively poorly across the sustainability and the adequacy. And um, I think that's aligned with what a lot of um, industry experts have said. And so, yes, increasing the um, contribution rates, looking at making them more mandatory, uh, would help. Uh, one area I think would really help is to um, change the tax treatments of our savings. At the moment, fundamentally, New Zealand is still pretty much a save as you go, uh, sorry, pay as you go uh, system rather than a save as you go uh, system. And the countries that have the highest across adequacy and sustainability tend to be much more save as you go systems. Andrew Coleman, uh, old colleague of mine, he's now back at the Reserve Bank in New Zealand. He's done very good work on this over a number of years. Mm. Uh, and he'd certainly advocate moving away from uh, the system we've got at the moment where you're taxed on your contributions, you're taxed on your savings, and you're taxed when you take it out yep. to something much more conventional, uh, conventional uh, globally, where you have some sort of uh, exemptions on your uh, contributions. You're not taxed on the way through and you face a higher tax uh, you know, when you retire. That is a way that helps deal partly at least with that equity issue as well because the, if people do build a higher retirement nest egg then they will face a higher uh, tax treatment. Um, before this panel started we were sort of musing I wonder what the government's uh, tax take is now from KiwiSaver. I'm pretty sure but I haven't been able to, to verify 
that it's now getting at least as high as the uh, member contributions. And I know for with regards to New Zealand superannuation fund, uh, it pays more in tax back to the government that, than the government uh, contributes mm. uh, annually. So a bit of a money go around there. It really doesn't make sense from the point of view of trying to boost um, overall uh, savings. Um, and the other point I would note, and uh, maybe Christina could also, uh, you know, have views on this, is a bit of a um, warning here in the uh, sustainability, I think it was, uh, pillar with low, relatively low households, high, sorry, relatively low household savings rates, high household debt and declining home ownership. Right, it's sort of all symptomatic of a, of a situation of um, historically having a very, very high reliance on housing as a nest egg, but that sort of moving, that sort of disappearing as an opportunity, particularly for younger people. So it does mean there needs to be, if you like, increased um, thought and reliance on uh, the pension system and on saving systems. And so really a bit of a, uh, a canary in the coal mine, I think, to thinking much more seriously about how we can uh, leverage the good works that have been done to improve the integrity of the system to now sort of turn attention more towards the, the basic design settings and trying to lift, um, you know, the um, amount of savings that are put into our New Zealand pension system. Yeah, great point, Sarah. Yeah, and then just, um, of course, housing is always a topical issue. And in terms of that whole, talking about the tax, various tax treatments, uh, just with how housing is such a popular investment in New Zealand reflects the uh, relative tax treatment of the different investments. Uh, as we've seen with the very low interest rate environment, it's um, contributing to that uh, divergence, the wealth inequality in the sense that if you're already on the housing ladder and you've got the equity, then a lower borrowing class does benefit. But of course, if you're just still trying to save for a deposit, then that 20% of like a price that keeps increasing will run away further and further. So that is very much a key part of that picture when it comes to retirement savings and what we should do in terms of the tax treatment of the various investment classes. Um, also just thinking about the, um, running through the list of questions, there was a question um, regarding immigration um, in the sense of that there's been anecdotes of greater immigration. Now, this is something that we've been looking at um, in, forecasting the outlook for the economy. And certainly uh, given that border restrictions remain in place and we're only allowing back New Zealanders and critical uh, people that fall under the critical worker category, um, then that's very much net migration is still remains at very low levels. What we saw over the past year was a spike up in net migration as uh, New Zealand rushed back in uh, before borders were closing and MIQ facilities started being put in place. And since then, it has remained at very low levels. Now, indications from the government is that given the uh, rollout of vaccine and what that's likely over the coming year, then they are in expecting that border restrictions will remain in place for much of 2021. Um, so we would expect that from that, that net migration will remain low. Mm. Even, um, it does invite that discussion of uh, perhaps what we would like to see in uh, migration policy and uh, the workers that are coming into New Zealand and what it means for productive capacity of the New Zealand economy. Yeah, it's, you know, it always, it, the points that um, you both made just highlights, you know, how important a piece in our whole, you know, the fabric of society that pensions actually pay, you know, you and how many parts of it are just all so connected. Um, so what does the future actually look like? Um, I'll just put these up as possible predictions. Um, a much more equal system. So we address the gender issues. We address the issues of, say, the agribusiness workers. Um, we have focused on, or there's a much more increased focus on contributions. Um, and making sure that if people are living longer, you can continue to contribute. Uh, why? Well, actually, this has been addressed, but certainly the 65 is, is just a, is just an, a day, a, a number for some people. Um, you know, the whole issue of engagement, you know, the, the FMA has been very big on this, and also MD. Um, how do we help? people make better decisions that suit their level of risk, their stage of life. 
making that much more available and accessible to all. And in the today with digitization and um, you know AI and that, you know, my belief is we're going to be able to do something pretty smart in that space to do some much better levels of um, decision making. And then those of, the, of us who have unique situations that then go to, to financial advisors or, or others for more uh, a different level of, um, of advice. And then the other thing is just making sure how do we keep people um, invested and, and keep them invested and, and generating those returns for a lot longer. And a lot of that is also invested in themselves. So retraining, learning and remaining is valuable in contributing um, to, the, to the economy, whether it be through paid work or through, through voluntary work. That's the end of the presentation. Uh, so perhaps now, if there are any closing comments on how Aaron and Christina see the future, then we'll open it up for wider questions. Yeah, uh, so again, just thinking about uh, the things that you've brought up, Martin, and then looking at the list of questions, uh, someone has asked whether financial literacy is a factor in all of this, and absolutely, um, as even we can see with the changes between the Kiwi saver types and people essentially locking in their losses uh, during the height of the lockdown when we had a downturn in the share markets and missed out on the subsequent rebound. It is very important, as you were saying, with the whole um, engaging people in understanding what their KiwiSaver is actually doing and how share markets are performing and what are the drivers of that and what are, how that aligns with their longer term goals when it comes to retirement savings and income. That does form a very important part of the picture there. Yes, thanks, Christina. I've got a question here on home ownership. Um, how does New Zealand rank? And yes, there is a question on it. And we rank about the middle of the pack. Um, you know, so countries like, um, gosh, is it Singapore? Yeah, Singapore ranks very high, but um, New Zealand did at about 50% the level of the Singaporean home, home ownership, but on a par with Australia and UK. Maybe I can um, um, get to a couple of the questions, Martin. One of them there was around um, growth assets and how does New Zealand compare? And um, that's something I looked at too. And um, so New Zealand scores are 10 out of 10, uh, but the, but the um, threshold is not particularly high. It means that in the pension system that it's around 50% or more in uh, growth assets. And we've got to Remember here that what's being measured isn't just KiwiSaver, it's also NZ Super, and there I've got a, around 80% allocation to growth assets, and that's roughly on the, the same size as KiwiSaver. And then uh, other parts of the pension system, corporate pension schemes, uh, et cetera, as well. Um, I think there is a good argument you can make as part of that question of dealing with uh, adequacy and sustainability to increase the uh, risk allocation within KiwiSaver. I know the government has accepted the industry's advice over a number of years to, to move from uh, default being defensive through to balanced. Uh, we would have liked to have seen them move all the way to some sort of life stages type approach where it's even higher risk allocation, but that's, that's uh, a good um, start. Uh, the other um, aspect uh, of, um, again, picking on KiwiSavers, if you look at New Zealand's KiwiSaver system, it's got the virtue of simplicity, um, not simplicity, but being simple, uh, compared to a lot of other systems in the sense it's fairly plain vanilla. But what that does mean is that um, there's very little, if any, allocation to some of the potentially higher risk, higher returning asset classes, private equity, infrastructure, uh, private market exposures in general. And that's tied in with the issue that there's just a requirement having a lot of liquidity and to manage redemption risk. So we, we think there is a number of tinkerings, if you like, that can be done with the system to enable suppliers to move towards a broader asset allocation where you can take, um, you know, potentially earn a higher return over the long run by investing into a broader range of asset classes. That being just part of the, the solution here, I think. Yeah, look, I think to Aaron, you've just answered the question under the lower interest rate environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, any plan, you know, and the concern is about the growth of KiwiSaver funds to, to meet 
retirement demands, any plans to mitigate this risk. Certainly global best practices to, you know, it's all about diversification and there are other asset classes other than shares and bonds um, that should feature in, in portfolios. Uh, one of the challenges that the industry, I'm sure, is, is facing is that there's a really significant focus on fees. Some of these asset classes are more expensive and they also have some liquidity challenges around them. Um, a higher contribution to KiwiSaver, well, well, actually to a policy revamp around the contribution levels. Yeah, look, um, I suppose broadly speaking, if I look at the sort of pick the, the, the a common themes of all the best schemes, um, there are several retirement income sources. Um, you have a good coverage of a private pension pillar and they have high contribution rates and we're talking 12% plus. So we've got quite a ways to go to get to the 12%. Um, you know, good coverage and high contributions does lead to a, a larger pool of assets. And then the, the, the final area is all, all pension systems. They have a really good regulatory and governance framework, you know, including the consumer protection and, and you know, really good engagement with, their, um, with the customers, with the Kiwi Savers and with the members. So, yeah, the answer to that one is I think it could be a policy revamp. Um, the, the thing, though, is that, you know, New Zealand is a relatively low wage economy and, you know, we continue hearing about the cost of housing. So, again, it, it gets really hard, as, as, you know, the trade-offs that need to be made. Do we um, enable households to buy a home, those sort of things, or do you force them? into a long-term savings vehicle. And those are decisions that are, you know, really are political decisions that and, and politicians be tapping into what they believe society is actually looking for and is in the best interests of, um, in our case, New Zealand Inc. Uh, equipment on the promotion of um, high labour force participation at older ages, what can we do to achieve this? Um, well, New Zealand does very well um, at um, having people staying in the workforce a lot longer. I think, you know, one of the perhaps the silver linings in the, in the pandemic is showing that we can actually work. You know, the workplace has changed dramatically and we can actually work in much more flexible ways. And so, you know, older people, um, we don't need to jam them into a nine to five um, the old way of working. So perhaps they need, um, you know, it's a case of tapping into your older workforce and understanding what their needs are, what they're looking for from the employer. But what we have found is, is flexibility, um, differing working hours, uh, respecting them for some of the, the value and the wisdom that they've actually had, um, you know, connect, connecting, providing them with um, opportunities to act as mentors, there's probably, you know, there's, there's many ways. I think first and foremost is connect in with your older workforce and, and see what they're really looking for and um, making sure that you, you, you meet those needs and you'll retain them. Well, one thing um, just related to that, um, Martin, which comes back to the, the comment around productivity and wages, et cetera, is that um, some of the pushback I've certainly had from um, policymakers in New Zealand government around our retirement system and the fact that um, you know it is a relatively low contribution rate is that um, you know we do have a fairly generous in terms of its universal coverage NZ super uh, we have very low rates of um, elderly poverty which is great and we do have a very relatively flexible uh, labor force in which um, the elderly uh, or people aged 65 plus tend to be remain uh, attached. So we don't have some of the pressures some of these other countries uh, have when people reach retirement. Some countries still have a sort of mandatory or, or soft mandatory retirement ages. We have nothing uh, like that. Uh, and then you'd, you'll hear the argument sometimes that, well, if we require people to contribute more to say KiwiSaver, then it means it's less money in their pocket. And I sort of think that just sort of misses the dynamics. If we have a system in which people are um, contributing more, 
that means as a, as a, as a country, New Zealand Inc. is building up its savings. Savings have to go somewhere. Um, and so that means more into investment and then in itself, particularly in systems where you enable the system to channel some of those savings towards you know, infrastructure and, and local investment can, can actually boost productivity levels and wages as well. So there, there is a virtuosity, if you like, around uh, or, or system dependency between the, the, our pension system and um, the uh, economy itself. And so I just think, yeah, it needs to be thinking around what those dynamics look like and how the pension system itself, designed well, can actually contribute towards raising New Zealand's productivity and wage levels. All right, thanks. Um, got a question, I'm sort of bouncing around here, so I don't feel as though I'm just avoiding the questions. I wonder if, um, Kylie, maybe I'll attack, we'll record these questions and get back to you all in case you feel that you've been totally missed out. But, the most recent question is about um, the proposed reforms we um, suggest for New Zealand. Um, are they what made uh, Denmark and the Netherlands score so high? Um, well, not necessarily. Uh, again, this gets back to it's one size does not fit all. So you've got to reflect what the local economy, the local culture is. And so both uh, Denmark and Netherlands have mandatory um, systems. Uh, the Netherlands has an absolute gold standard. They've got a defined benefit um, schemes, which are tied basically with the trade, so they're occupationally based. Denmark has something similar, but they aren't defined benefit, they're defined contribution. Um, maybe the horse is bolted on mandatory and um, defined benefits for New Zealand, but you can never say never. Um, Politicians come and go, and we may get a change in political environment. Um, the closest we've got to the defined benefit, obviously, is and look, we did we got ten out of ten for our New Zealand super. You know, it's essentially, it's it's tied to the median wage, um, and so that will continue to to grow um, if the median wage actually goes up, and it's there for life. It, it never runs out. Or it runs out when you you run out. I flick this one to Christine again. It gets back. Um, is there any idea or model to divert people from property investment? Um, got any thoughts on that one, Christine? Yeah. So as I always say, when it comes to discussing the housing market, as with any investments, it's about balancing the rate of return or expected rate of return, I should say, on investment versus. Uh, the cost of borrowing. Anytime the rate of return outweighs the cost of borrowing that makes sense to invest in that particular asset class. And of course, at the moment with record low mortgage rates, that is very much skewed towards and, expect, and with that expectation of capital gains down the track particularly, um, then it's very much skewed towards rate of investment. So uh, rate of return, I should say. So when it comes to, is there a way to get this more in balance? Well, uh, raising mortgage rates would be one where you would have the cost of borrowing, making it less of an attractive investment. And then, of course, when it comes to um, changing that expectation of rate of return, things such as tax comes into play. Uh, for example, capital gains tax will go some way towards reducing that expected rate of return or the government committing to uh, increasing housing supply to such an extent that people um, believe that this will contribute to an easing in house prices, again, that will uh, contribute to that being more in balance, that expected rate of return versus cost of borrowing. So um, a lot of different factors at play. So anything that changes that balance so that we have less of that skew towards the rate of return would go some way towards um, taking the heat out of the housing market. Thanks, Christina. Um, one of the big trends, well, one of the big trends over the last decade has been the move to passive, but I think one of the new trends over the last 12 months, perhaps a couple of years, has been the ESG move. Aaron, have you got any views, the, the current and future ESG considerations changing for New Zealand and, and global pension systems? What's yeah. the best thinking going on that? Mm, yeah, so I think um, it, it is a something where New Zealand is, is, is a leader. Um, 
uh, along with um, actually those systems which score very highly in uh, Netherlands, Denmark, etc. Um, so uh, if you look at uh, New Zealand Super, um, ACC, the Crown Financial Institutions, they've had long embedded uh, SRI policies and, and, and integrate ESG, not just in what they're doing in listed markets, but any of their private market uh, activities as well. And KiwiSaver, certainly over the past three or four years, has rapidly improved there too, from just having a handful of exclusions in place uh, to tra try more systematically to uh, integrate ESG across all the asset classes invested into, which is really good to see. Um, uh, one of the things that your, your report picked up, which was really interesting, is we scored a, a zero. <laughs> <laughs> on um, on the fiduciary duty question because it's not mandatory that um, that um, boards uh, people who have got fiduciary positions uh, must consider uh, ESG, but in practice, I, I do observe that it does tend to happen uh, anyway. Um, so I think that's uh, that's a trend which is going to continue. Potentially, it's, it's a trend which is going to lead to taking more of a view, if you like, relative to market around some of the sustainability questions, fossil fuel sector as well. Um, the uh, Aotearoa Circle um, has put forward a, a couple of reports over the past year looking at how our financial system can be tweaked and adjusted to take more consideration of climate change and sustainability risks, and, and clearly, uh, the pension system KiwiSaver is, is part of that mix. There's a number of suggestions there. Uh, one I sort of quite like, because I think tax ultimately is really important and matters, is um, potentially having lower, for example, uh, PIE tax rates applied to funds which, you know, get a healthy heart tick with regards how they, they genuinely integrate ESG. So I'm just going to be careful of that greenwashing issue. So, yeah, I think it's, a, it's something that's, that's, that's necessary given... Um, uh, uh, the sustainability concerns we have around uh, climate change and, and um, it's something that I think is part of fiduciary duty and I just think it's just going to keep on continuing. Yeah, no, look, and good point. I think too we will reflect that in the, um, the questions going out for the next survey. Um, there's a subtle different mandatory, but look, when you get very strong political leadership um, and directions saying KiwiSaver, default tender processes and that it's as good as mandatory or if you're not doing it you, you're missing something. Um, Charlene's asked a, a good question it's on the financial survey and you know, it gets back to this whole advice and communication and um, yeah the, the, it's a challenge that a lot of these people um, you know paying for advice is either something that's a bit foreign to them or, or something something new that they, um, or they don't think they need to pay for advice. So what can be done and, uh, and or how to help to create as a sustainable business model? Um, one thing that we have seen at, at Mercer is some of the large corporates, are, well, in fact, one of our large um, customer clients has created what they call, a, a, you know, essentially a financial hub. And so there's a range of financial assets that um, their employees can tap into. And one of them is free advice. So there's an el element of subsidization from the overall costs or, or fees that people are paying. They're in fact uh, subsidizing a, a cohort that can't afford to pay for that advice. And maybe that's something we have to look at that, um, you know, it's just one of those those costs of being part of a, a group or a, an employer group or a, a club or something that, um, you know, some people benefit from it and others are quite happy to, to do that um, and not necessarily benefit directly from the service, but benefit from, from the contribution that they make to the overall pooling. Um, but I wonder if the other panellists, uh, Christina or Aaron, got any thoughts on the sustainability of the financial service or financial advice? industry yeah i mean we we work quite closely with that part of the industry um i think part of the um of the solution here which is um already hopefully largely being put in place is to improve the integrity and, and to create more trust 
uh, and that the public can have in financial advisors and a lot of the effort the FMA has done around the code of conduct, increasing regulatory standards. I know it's a pain to deal with if you're an advisor that's always done a good job, but, but that does increase the trust in the system and that's important. I think partly the solution here and we're starting to see it is a bit of um, evolution in the inter uh, between say the KiwiSaver providers and advisors. So enabling advisors to work with providers to provide more concrete advice to KiwiSaver members. Um, and uh, I think we saw an earlier question anyway around the fact that a lot of people switched to defensive and hopefully any of uh, the advisors on the call would have stopped that <laughs> or at least um, had that training in place so people weren't jumping at the wrong time to, um, towards defensive. Um, look, I think it's partly a communication issue. Like I always I say to advisors, um, if you can sort of demonstrate to your clients that on a unique present value or a life over the life stages since, you know, if we're able to lift your return, whatever it is, to get you in the right risk profile, that, that's that's worth, you know, tens of thousands of dollars potentially. And so our, our fee is actually very small uh, comparison to that. So it's partly a framing uh, a question. People unfortunately look at advisors a bit like an accountant and a lawyer and, and sort of think, oh, uh, as opposed to think about that, you know, that intertemporal, that, that benefit mm -hmm. that they can really um, create over, over the, the, the life cycle of someone uh, saving and using good financial advice. Yeah, yeah uh, nothing, good point. Yeah, nothing new to add. I would say, yeah, as Aaron said, the integrity is quite uh, key to uh, improving the uh, standards and then also with the improving the financial literacy. Okay. Now I've got a question here on the gender pension gap. Uh, is New Zealand better in this area than the rest of the globe? Look, I do not know. So I will get back to you if we can find the answer out to that one. Um, I think we've addressed um, a lot of these questions. I see anybody feels that they've really, we haven't, perhaps they have another crack at putting the question up and we will do what we can to, to answer it. There's a question on life expectancy on the potential funding gap, perhaps. Oh, right, you yeah, know, we did miss that. Yeah, look, um, that is certainly um, having a big impact on um, two things. One is obviously how much you need to save. Then the thing is how much you think you will need um, when you've exited the workforce and are no longer earning income through paid employment. Um, and then how long you're likely to live. And as we're seeing, um, certainly the expectations are that people are living a lot longer. Um, you know, people born today, um, over 50% of them will live greater than 100 years. So you can sort of imagine the implications of that. And certainly if you've made it to 60 today, um, you've got a better than a 50-50 chance of making it to over 85. Um, and the odds, the, 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 the length goes up um, as you get older of living just that bit longer. So it does create uh, a larger gap. So that is one of the challenges that we have. Probably a good one. I think most of us want to live longer as long as we're living uh, healthily and uh, doing a bit better than a uh, bread and butter um, diet. I think uh, Westpac and the Massey University have done a lot of good work in trying to figure out what is a reasonable level of, um, of income and, and come up with the, I don't know if they call it the bread and butter and the beer and chips and the champagne and lifestyles, but they certainly have two or three tranches of lifestyles. And um, that, I suppose the one thing from that is it's actually not, um, you know, the numbers you need to save aren't astronomical. You know, some people get, might get back to the financial advice. You sit there and think, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have to, I could never, ever save that much. But it actually is quite interesting when you start to do the numbers um, that it is actually attainable. And uh, I think the ballpark number is somewhere around that three to 400,000. As long as you start, as soon as you start working, is not beyond um, most New Zealanders. So... 
that's a, a good thought, you know, park that thought. Yeah, and anecdotally, from what I hear, sometimes the challenge is in getting people to spend that money once they've retired. <laughs> that's right, yeah, you've, you've retired and you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh no, <laughs> I'm going to live for another 30 or 40 years, but there's no point in um, doing that in a state of penury um, and, and leave it to your any dependents or the cat. answered all the questions posted here but certainly if there's um, any outstanding do feel free to get in touch with any of us on the panel and we'll do our best to get back to you. Uh, so thanks everyone for attending and thanks to Martin for presenting the findings. Uh, very lot brings up a lot of different interesting topics for discussion policy implications so certainly uh, this is the start of a interesting policy debate for the years ahead, um, not one we can easily solve. <laughs> um, and so yeah, thanks very much everyone for attending. Uh, so I just wanted to say that also a recording of this will be available and emailed to everybody. So thanks also to Aaron for participating as a panelist. Hey, thanks, uh, I'd really like to thank you all, Christina, Aaron and Kylie for arranging and, and a big thanks to the um, CFA Institute for supporting us. And as Christine says, hey, look, it's, there's no definitive answers here. It's just let's start the discussion and get the policy discussion and debate going. Kia ora. Got it. Thank you. Thank you.